Wait, should we uh, get started? Or, um, Ajit, uh, Ajit? Maybe let's give it a couple of minutes, I think, uh, for people to join. It's 7.58 right now. Yeah. People are coming in. Hello everyone, uh, we should be starting in another minute or so. We put everyone to join. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our session today. I'd like to um, welcome all of you, but uh, turn it over to Santosh for opening remarks. Oh, thank you. Uh, not, not really opening remarks, but to, just to say, um, so, hey, I'm, my name is Santosh Ramdas. I'm a, uh, I work at the Skoll Foundation, part of the investments team. Um, and I'm excited to kind of kicking this off, um, um, this particular event as part of the Skoll World Forum Week. Um, hosted by our dear friends um, at the Nudge Foundation. Um, and thanks for coming together and putting this together. Just a couple of things before we, I hand it off to Amit uh, to moderate and run the show. Um, as you all know, the Skull World Forum takes place every year um, in Oxford, England. We bring together about 1,200 leaders across social sector um, and social entrepreneurship, philanthropy, and social change. Um, and this year, we were forced to cancel the forum due to the ongoing COVID-19 crisis and the epidemic. Um, uh, like many of you, uh, our team, including me, we're all working remotely and uh, sheltered in place. Um, and um, I think um, finding interesting and new ways to balance the importance of health and safety, as well as uh, keeping our work going in the global community. And this effort is very uh, a significant testament to that. Um, and I also add this year's forum, the team was collective strength. We came up with it before um, COVID hit. And uh, I honestly have been completely inspired by how true that team is in, in, in relation to where we are in the world today. Um, we've had about 120 organizations in our ecosystem who've come together and hosted events independently, um, just like these ones. Uh, and we've really pushed the limits on what um, a new format can look like. And we've kind of imagined, reimagined uh, the idea of a virtual forum. And so uh, I'm excited that we're, you're all part of this experiment. Uh, and Amit and I were just chatting before this, saying this could be a new reality where we don't have to wait for Oxford every year to come together as a community, but we could do it more impromptu and an ongoing basis because uh, we're able to bridge these bridge these gaps. Um, 
All right, lastly, um, in addition to a lot of independently hosted ecosystem events like this one, we do have an uh, announcement of our school awards, um, which uh, is actually happening tomorrow, Thursday, April 2nd at 11 a.m. Eastern, um, which um, I would love for you all to join. Uh, it's gonna be really exciting, it's a live show, um, but also like a moment to celebrate some exceptional social entrepreneurs around the world. Um, Great, so on that note, I just want to turn it back to uh, Amit and team from Nudge uh, and for our panelists uh, to run the show. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity to use the Skull platform to uh, have this discussion. Thank you so much, Santosh. Um, it's, it's been great uh, having this platform and the way Skull has put this together in the last two weeks, phenomenal. And it's, it's just really great to see all the sessions. So, um, hello everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening depending on whatever part of the world you're joining from. Uh, my name is Amit Varshne. Uh, I'm the CEO for North America at the Nudge Foundation, and uh, it's my pleasure to be the host for the session today. Um, just a quick introduction to the Nudge. Uh, we're a development organization fo focusing on poverty alleviation, both sustainably and scalably. And we do that through direct and indirect impact programs. Uh, we build direct impact by building sustainable livelihoods for uh, underprivileged youth and families through jobs and micro entrepreneurship. And then uh, we create indirect impact by nudging talent to solve for India's biggest uh, problems. These are uh, challenging times for all of us. And for, first of all, I want to thank all of you for all the work that you're doing in your communities to help uh, everyone through these tough times. And thank you for joining the session as we talk about the work being done in poverty alleviation in India the challenges it faces, as well as uh, what can be done to support and strengthen it. Uh, before we proceed, uh, just some housekeeping items. We have a one hour session today. The discussion will be, we want to keep it for the first 45 minutes and keep the remaining 40, 15 minutes for Q&A from the audience. Um, everyone, from, except for the panelists, is going to be on mute for the session just to keep it simple and uh, streamlined. To ask questions, uh, please type them into the Q&A box. You should see it um, on the panel somewhere towards the bottom or wherever your control panel is. There's also a chat box, but preferably if you use the Q&A box, that way you can see other questions and you can, uh, um, you can uh, vote on them. Uh, we are recording today's session and uh, the recording will be available on demand after today. We will be posting it on uh, the school uh, virtual forum website under our session but it will also be available on uh, our website, www.thenudge.org and through our social media handles on LinkedIn and Facebook. So if you're not already following us on LinkedIn and Facebook, please go ahead and do that. Uh, any other questions that we do not answer or we're not able to answer in today's session, please write to us at partnerships at thenudge.org and we will get back to you promptly. So uh, now onto the topic of the day. Uh, so India has been on a path of poverty alleviation and there's been commendable progress happening in the last two decades. Uh, this has also been a story of uh, the developing ecosystem in India growing up and attracting great talent that has come up with ideas and programs that have collectively been chipping away at the problem with, uh, of course, with help from supporters and funding. Uh, we are, however, now in the midst of a major global event and it is certain, right? Just like, just like just like Santosh was saying earlier, normalcy and the future are not going to look the same as they did two months back. Uh, the context that we're going to go back in, the needs and the path, it's going to chart a totally different course from two months back. Uh, so the discussion today will dive deeper into the journey India has had in poverty alleviation and what the future looks like. On the panel today, we have uh, Shloka Nath from Tara Trust. Shloka currently leads the sustainability and special projects portfolio at the Tata Trust, one of India's leading philanthropic foundations. In this role, she's focused on the organization's work on climate, energy, and environment, implementing and funding sustainable and scalable solutions that help both people and nature thrive through India. She is also the executive director of the India Climate Collaborative, an India-led platform founded in 2018 by a group of philanthropies interested in continuing to accelerate India's development while also exceeding its climate goals. Also on the panel is Arnav Kapoor from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Arnav leads the philanthropic partnerships portfolio in India and South Asia with the objective of strengthening the philanthropic ecosystem and partnering with individuals, 
family offices, and corporates to have impact at scale across the priority areas of the foundation. He also helped develop the foundation's first integrated South and Southeast Asia strategy. He previously worked with the policy and poverty alleviation team, where he helped develop the PPA investment portfolio and the foundation's agriculture development policy strategy. And finally, speaking with Arnav and Shloka is Sudha Srinivasan. Sudha is CEO of Encore, also called the Nudge Center for Social Innovation, which is on a mission to nudge and nurture top talent to solve India's most critical problems. Since its launch in 2017, Encore has incubated 60 nonprofit startups, including 25 technology-based startups, solving problems of power. Its accelerator fund supports high potential nonprofits that are ready for growth and scale. So um, to get started, Sudha, Shloka, Arnav, um, let's get to know our audience a little bit more. And I'm thinking maybe we um, run a quick poll. Um, so for everyone in the audience, you should see a poll uh, question coming up. Uh, we just want to know, you know, what organization you represent, uh, which organization you're from, just to get a good pulse of um, the makeup of the group we're interacting with. So we'll keep this poll running for a few more seconds, uh, maybe for another minute, and then we can get started. <clears throat> So, um, Sudha, Arnav, Shoka, do you see the results? Do you see the poll happening? Not yet. Not yet, okay. Not yet. See the poll, but not the results. Okay, got it, got it. Okay, so I think I'm, I will, so I'll be ending it in another few more seconds. Let's give it 10 more seconds. All right, I think it looks like most people have polls. So I'm going to end and share results. That's interesting. Yeah. So I think the majority of today's audience is uh, either grant making organizations or program execution organizations. There are some educational institutes, not much media, but quite a few enablers. Very interesting mix. Uh, and I look forward to the discussions. Thank you, Santosh and uh, Amit, for kicking, kicking us off to what I hope is a very engaging session. Uh, I'd like to take the next few minutes to just walk us through what India's journey as a country has been uh, towards economic prosperity and well being. And nothing tells that story better than this graph. Um, a whopping 271 million Indians have lifted themselves out of poverty in just the last 10 years. I joined the development sector after a couple of decades in the high-tech industry in, about, in 2016, at which time it was very common to hear people say that India is the house to uh, the largest population of poor anywhere in the world. Um, in just the last four years, we have brought down the number of people living in extreme poverty to less than 3%, and that's a very notable accomplishment. What I also used to hear a lot in those days was that, hey, don't get too carried away by numbers on uh, income and wealth, because poverty is multidimensional, and I never quite understood it. The next slide shows the picture that makes it very easy to understand. This is a picture of India's rankings in performance on SDG, and you see nothing there is green. Our rank is 115 worldwide in terms of our achievement of goals on sustainable development. Our human development ranking is 130, and if you just took India's 10 poorest states, that rank would be upwards of 165. It's a very telling tale on how poverty is far more than just economic well-being. There are very critical measures in nutrition, education, sanitation, healthcare uh, that reflect on the performance of public systems in these areas. And if those are weak, it just means there's a lot of work to be done. But if you 
have interacted with anyone in the Indian development sector, you'll also sense a note of great optimism. Right? So people believe indeed that we are on track despite how bad the numbers look. That this is absolutely the right time to accelerate India's pathway out of poverty. Bring that 3% in extreme poverty down to zero and perhaps even alleviate extreme poverty in our lifetime. The one big reason why that seems true is because since the 90s, when India started making huge investments in developing human capital, it's about 25 years since, and we are seeing the results of that. 20 million young Indians graduate from our universities this, each year. What this graph shows is you know, 2.6 million graduating as STEM graduates. Uh, the picture is very similar if you look at healthcare or law or business or any area of work, and you can see the talent flowing into the various sectors of the economy. What's even more interesting than the numbers of people graduating is the mindset with which they are graduating. Um, young Indians are far more socially conscious than say we were in our generation. The number of young Indians engaging with social problems and wanting to make it their lives work is increasing by the day. Their role models have changed. Right? In my generation, it was about movie stars and cricket players. Today, you'll hear young people follow uh, Sonam Wangchuk or Mohammed Yunus with equal zeal. Uh, they may not be household names yet, but they do have a social media following. And the conversations are largely about changing the world and there's just optimism in the air. Talent alone, however, is not sufficient as we all know. For talent to jump in and make development their liability to philanthropic capital. The good news is that too is on an upward trend. The Indian private philanthropy sector has grown at 15% year on year versus the 10% that uh, is an increase in public spending on developmental work. And even there, um, individuals have started giving a lot more. The first few years of the corporate sustainability law that requires profitable companies to donate 2% of their net earnings created a huge pool of capital that was available to nonprofits to do their work. What's a very pleasant trend is that individuals, and this includes retail giving as well as giving by uh, people that are making the UHNI lists uh, by the dozens, are also starting to give. And there's a certain purposeful giving, a certain mindful giving uh, emerging in dom domestic philanthropy in a very visible way. Um, one very notable thing is the emergence of risk capital. When we started the incubator about a year, about three years ago, uh, it was a complete white space. Right? There was very little innovation capital available for early stage nonprofits. The good news is, that by the day you hear of more incubators, accelerators, uh, early stage investment in nonprofits is also growing. Every sector of work has been disrupted you know, uh, by startups. The way we plan our vacations to how we order our food has changed because of the emergence of new kids on the block, the startups that are changing the world through their innovative business models and their sense of urgency to become big, to achieve scale. In the development sector too, one is starting to see that pattern emerge. One of the most difficult problems that India has had to deal with is its attention on the female child and getting the female child to school. A very complex social problem like that, which is at the intersection of economics, of gender relations, of uh, society at large, is being disrupted by an amazing startup that's Educate Girls. Educate Girls now is an audacious project and is counting its impact in millions and in terms of percentage of population addressed. You see that in a lot of technology-based startups as well. One of our incubators, Kushi Baby, is disrupting the way India is monitoring its immunization programs. They've devised a wearable device, a Taviz, 
uh, that records the immunization data of a child and are now part of a state program that is Nirogi Rajasthan and have won MIT Solves Global Challenge uh, as one of the bright ideas changing the world. Uh, Meraki is changing the way parents engage with their children's education and has been named Fast Company's Idea Changing the World. Young nonprofits, less than three years old, uh, are finding a seat at the table to work with governments and improve public systems. The DNA of the sector is changing to one of collaboration, sustainable change, innovation, scale, and with a sense of urgency to solve these problems with speed. And that's a very notable, remarkable thing. While you're on this major high, uh, we've also hit a big inflection point in our journey, uh, which is the current situation with COVID. Um, I'm sure a lot will be spoken about how COVID is changing the world and how the new normal will not be uh, what we used to, you know, two months ago. But from my vantage point, I see two very distinct areas um, in which this vulnerability needs to be managed. One is the vulnerability of nonprofits themselves. Functioning in a regulatory environment where nonprofits do not have access to a corpus of money uh, or access to building a surplus that will see them to tough times. We have to reflect deeply on what regulatory changes are required to make sure that high potential nonprofits can continue to work despite shocks of the nature that we are experiencing. The other big point of vulnerability is our public systems themselves. Uh, would India as a country have taken a different course to addressing the COVID challenge if we had had greater confidence in our primary health care? Would our strategies have been different? Would we have seen less of the unintended consequences of a lockdown uh, and its impact on migrant laborers and what it's done in setting them back in their uh, path out of poverty. The answers lie in addressing uh, these vulnerabilities in a proactive manner. Uh, it's my pleasure to you know, uh, host the rest of the session with Shloka and Arnav who bring in very deep insights. Uh, but before that, I think we should take a very quick poll on how uh, the audience themselves are experiencing this current disruption. So we'll do the same thing. Uh, just a quick poll. Um, here's five options. You should see something come up on your screens. And we'll give it a minute. Uh, we just want to know, you know, what impact you've seen in decision making on grants over the past six weeks and whether it's, you know, gone down, slowed down, to whether it's actually increased moderately or substantially. All right, 10 more seconds, and then you close the poll. So get your votes in now. All right. Um, Expect to be surprised. <laughs> OK. So 34% say it has reduced or slowed down. Uh, and 26 55%. Yeah, so 55% say it's as either substantially or moderately slowed down. And around 30% say it has moderately or substantially gone up. But substantially is very low. It's mostly, mostly moderately gone up. Very nice. All right, so with that, um, Shloka, I think um, you've had a particularly interesting journey as Tata Trusts. Uh, before we get deeper into COVID, I just want to establish our baseline on where we are as a country. 
Tata Trusts have calibrated their mission as addressing the world's most urgent needs, and I'm sure there's a proximity bias to India as a geography in stating that mission. Uh, how has the, the journey been in this past decade? Do you see us on track uh, in handling critical challenges with a sense of urgency? What are some of the bright sparks and where are the gaps? Thanks, Sudha, and hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for inviting me to be a part of this panel. I'm very heartened to see that sort of, you know, the world hasn't ground completely to a halt and there are still ways in which we can connect and interact. Um, and so, you know, hats off to you guys for, for pulling this panel together. Um, it's, it's super urgent. Um, so, Sudha, to your point, and, and by the way, that was an excellent presentation. I think you covered pretty much sort of uh, um, the entire gamut of, of challenges and gaps and, and sort of areas that need to be addressed. I think in the context of the Tata Trust and to your question specifically, um, let me just start off by, by very quickly giving you sort of um, some information around what we're doing for the COVID crisis. And that's really in line with um, the mission statement that you just read out, which is trying to address the most urgent needs. Um, you know, as, as quickly as we can. And at this moment, it feels as though the need of the hour is greater than any other time. Um, we've committed about 500 crores to all affected communities. Um, and most of these funds will be used for personal protective equipment, for medical personnel on the front lines, for respiratory systems, for treating uh, the increasing number of cases, uh, as well as testing kits um, to increase sort of the per capita testing right now. And we're also hoping to use this to sort of set up modular treatment facilities for infected patients, as well as knowledge management and training of health workers in the general public. So that's what we're doing uh, when it comes to sort of uh, meeting the demands of, the, of, of fighting the COVID crisis as it, as it currently stands. I think in terms of um, the broader question that you asked and, you know, how is India sort of meeting these challenges? I think our work has in India has always focused on fortifying vulnerable communities, making them more resilient and adaptable to their rapidly changing circumstances, while also working to minimize these effects on a sustainable basis. And I think this has always been in line with India's national priorities. As you rightly pointed out, we're now in the fifth year of the SDG era. Um, and, um, you know, our progress on these sort of crucial goals is, um, is moderate. Uh, we are, for instance, the first country in the world with a government-led sub-national measure of progress on the SDGs. And the, the Tata Trusts are very much a part of that, um, that drive. Um, we've seen the maximum sort of gains uh, in goal six, which is clean water and sanitation, goal nine, which is industry innovation and infrastructure, and of course, goal seven, which is affordable and clean energy. And so there is a show of capability, motivation to improve, and I think progress above all um, to show a great sort of commitment to India's future. But there are tremendous gaps. And the gaps really are, um, you know, I think something that we can see, you know, right where we stand today, if you take an assessment of India's resilience during this current crisis, it shows that the interconnectedness of health, social, financial, and environmental systems is lacking at multiple levels. A good case in point, for instance, is that COVID or COVID type infections will affect most and where people are most vulnerable. It's going to be the same places where there are the greatest nutritional deficiencies, for instance. So what we really need to build in is a deeper understanding of vulnerable populations and inefficient systems um, so that we can help design responses to disaster reliefs or curfews, et cetera, in a way that they don't increase the vulnerabilities or collapse already strained systems. So to this effect, um, and to, to your question again around the Tara Trusts, um, what has become increasingly clear to us is the need to create collaboration and societal platforms to address each issue in a way um, that is thoughtful and will maximize impact. So we all need to acknowledge that solving these problems will be more effective if we can bring on partners, whether it's the government or the private sector, to maximize and amplify and spread the scale of that impact. You know, in the past, I keep saying that the Tata Trusts, we used to build brick and mortar institutions. And today we're, we're still building institutions, but this is, it's more field building. It's building in systems and ensuring a sustainable future for all. Yes, so the role is also changing to become a convener of an ecosystem. And yeah, what a remarkable journey that has been. 
Arnold, the Gates Foundation is also a couple of decades old in India now, almost there. Uh, and yours is a story of collaboration with institutions, governments, corporates, communities. Uh, I was quite taken in by what you say on your website, and I quote, um, that India is overflowing with ambition and innovation. If innovators from every sector work together, uh, then we're likely to achieve far more and achieve our ambitions much faster. Uh, what are, again, some of the bright sparks uh, where the needle has moved significantly in a problem area? And what do you attribute that success to? Hey, uh, thanks, Uda, for you know, having me. Uh, and thanks to the entire Nudge team. Uh, and thanks a lot of everyone for joining from various parts of the globe. Uh, you know, we are in uncharted world right now, uh, and I really, really hope that everyone's, uh, you know, staying safe uh, and doing well. Uh, you know, as you're aware, at the Gates Foundation, uh, we believe that all lives have equal value, uh, and the work of a foundation is guided by that mission. Uh, you know, we focus on the areas of greatest need and in which we can have the greatest impact. Uh, one of our comparative advantages actually is innovation, is a focus on innovation, uh, on thinking outside the box, uh, you know, with our partners to generate new solutions. Uh, we work primarily in five sectors in India, uh, you know, health, uh, agriculture, gender equality, sanitation, and um, wash. Uh, you know, we've seen progress along all those five, uh, you know, which your slide is quite, uh, uh, you know, uh, illustrative, uh, you know, but we've seen the needle move, you know, uh, on all those sides. So let me just pick up health as one example, given that, you know, uh, approximately 70% of our investments over the last two decades have been in healthcare uh, in India. Uh, so we work both at the national level and at the state level. Uh, we primarily focus on two, uh, you know, states uh, in India, uh, which is Bihar and UP. Uh, Bihar is about 110 million in population. Uh, so we're, just to put in perspective, uh, for folks running across the globe, it could be the 12th largest country if it was an independent country. Uh, you know, we've been working in Bihar since 2010. Uh, that's roughly been a decade now. And we've seen significant improvement across various, you know, health indicators. Uh, just to name a few, uh, you know, maternal mortality has gone down from 312 to about yes. 165. Uh, infant mortality has reduced from 6 to 35. Uh, at the same time, we've seen vaccination rates, you know, go up uh, from 18% to 84%. Uh, institutional delivery, uh, you know, has gone up from a paltry 4% to about 80% now. Uh, you know, three interventions, uh, you know, which in some way could have contributed to this effort since it's a large collaborative effort that we run with a lot of stakeholders. Uh, you know, one could look at nurse mentoring, is something which we work with the ANMs, uh, which are frontline health workers. Uh, we've got them trained from specially trained hospital nurses. Uh, we set up labs to help them train. Uh, train about 5,000 nurses uh, as on date, you know, who are now effectively able to manage and identify uh, complications without a doctor in the room. Uh, you know, we've seen declines in the last uh, five years of NMR from 23%. Uh, you know, and Still, birth rate has also gone up by more than 20%. Uh, another example, you know, you mentioned uh, so that technology. I think, you know, we uh, believe in tech. Um, you know, Bill is a great believer in technology, given that, you know, all his work in life has been in tech. Uh, we work closely with the Ministry of Women and Child Development, uh, and we have developed a common application software. Um, just to give perspective, earlier, Anganwadi workers, uh, who are the frontline head workers for nutrition, we used to enter information into about 11 registers, uh, you know, which is a pain, painful process. It's time intensive, it's clumsy. Uh, you know, we've developed this common application software. Now these Anganwadi workers can upload the information on their mobile device. Uh, and roughly about 650,000 workers, uh, you know, are using this uh, device right now. Uh, the data is coming real time, which is helping inform the government to make decisions. Uh, the third, quickly, you know, is an in intervention on the demand side, which I want to talk about, is the self-help group model. Uh, you know, self-help groups, to put perspective, are uh, basically a form of women collectives, uh, which were aimed at empowering women, uh, you know, and primarily were on financial inclusion, but we've leveraged this platform now to look at, you know, more 
healthcare and nutrition. Uh, and we've seen that, you know, when you layer health and nutrition into the self-help groups, uh, we've seen again increases in various interventions. Yeah, so um, the, the question begs asking, so the pre-existence of these systems and this infrastructure in good times, which is the normal times, is that helping in a black swan event like the one that we're going through? Uh, of course, it's certainly it's helping in that event. Um, you know, even this, if this the health system was much broken 10 years back, if you would look at it. Uh, now it's, you know, at a very different level, different scale. Of course, you know, we need to look at sustainability and a lot of work still needs to be done on that side. Uh, but at least the government, you know, has a war room in place in these two states. Uh, you know, the health line workers, uh, you know, uh, are better prepared than before. Uh, the supply chains are working better than before. Uh, you know, not to say that a lot of work not needs to be done, uh, you know, but having some of this work over the last 10 years and, you know, working with all of our partners who are, you know, uh, had talked to them. They're working on the ground with the government. The government's working 24 hours, uh, you know, to make sure that the response, you know, is adequate uh, given the urgent need. Uh, right. you know, we've come to some distance, but I think there's still a lot of path that we need to travel. Yeah. So I just want to acknowledge the anonymous attendees question here, which says, uh, "How do nonprofits work with the government to better health outcomes instead of working parallelly?" And I think what you just said kind of responds to that question. Uh, but there's also an element of, does the case of US healthcare reiterate the need for overhaul or major redesign of public good system in India? Any thoughts there, either Arnav or Shloka? Yeah, I think, I mean, my quick response, uh, you know, would be that, of course, I think the entire health system design needs to be looked at. Uh, right. We are working closely with the government on that. 70% uh, of our care is still private care and 30% is, you know, in the government system, uh, and that number continues to diminish uh, day on day. Right. Uh, the government is also looking at it. They've come up with Ayushman Bharat, uh, which is a focus scheme on health insurance, uh, which is you know a great move forward given that 64% of our expenditure is out of pocket right now. Right. Um, I think that that scheme, uh, you know, with the government integrating with that primary healthcare component, uh, you know, would just fit the bill and you know help us move forward in that direction. Uh, primary healthcare is an integral part. The Aishman Bharat looks at secondary and tertiary. But yeah, health financing, human resources, uh, you know, the infrastructure, these are all integral health system design components that the government is keenly looking at and we are closely working with them along with many other partners and foundations in India. Correct. Yeah, and just to add to that, Sudha, I would just say that, you know, the currency of... Um, of philanthropy is really complexity and and that's where we can play sort of the most pivotal role and partnering with government as well as other stakeholders um in as arnav rightly said things like program design and building capacity is the right way forward and so just to give you a couple of examples of what we're doing on the tata trust side we've partnered with the government of india and dell on non-communicable diseases and so um we actually have a memorandum memorandum of understanding with the ministry of health um, supporting the NCD program. And so we've set up a number of technical support units at the national as well as state level for providing techno managerial support to strengthen program implementation, service delivery. Um, so through these TSUs, the Tata Trust supports field monitoring, capacity building, as well as mentoring support to service delivery functions at different levels. And we use a digital platform to ensure successful delivery of the NCD program. Another great example is the India Nutrition In Initiative called TINI. Uh, for short at the Tata Trust. And so here we work really closely with the Food and Safety Standards Authority of India to define and notify standards of fortification for wheat, oil, milk, uh, salt, rice, etc. It's a major step towards promoting fortified staple foods with defined standards as a key intervention for improvement in um, the micronutrient status of the population at a very reasonable cost. Um, of course, I think most people are familiar with the Tata Trust Cancer Care Initiative, which is, you know, we're partnering with state governments and other entities to establish cancer care facilities across the country. Um, it's a really distributed sort of cancer control model. Um, and to take cancer treatments closest to where patients are. And I think, again, the, the reason I'm giving these examples is just because it's, it's required a lot of sort of differential thinking around um, service delivery and breaking those models up, um, you know, sort of being more disruptive in terms of how we think about supporting um, uh, external stakeholders like the private sector or government in order to ensure that, you know, vulnerable populations are served. 
also awesome examples of government, private sector, and civil society coming together as a triage. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much for that, Shloka. Uh, very quickly to change gears, and this is something we've all worried about, and Chitra Ayer has asked the question on whether there's a Red Sea scenario emerging. Uh, is the current focus, uh, corporate India, philanthropists in India have been very quick to spring into action and fund COVID prevention as well as COVID remedial action activities. But will that come at the cost of uh, investing in thematics and outcomes uh, that have a longer time horizon? Uh, Shloka, your work is also in climate change and you can see the interrelations of uh, the current crisis with climate change. Uh, do you think it's a Red Sea situation where we're diverting philanthropy and not necessarily adding to the total pool of philanthropic capital available to solve these very important problems? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, now I feel that you've given me the opportunity to start talking about climate change. I may not stop, but um, <laughs> it's obviously an issue that's really close to my heart. And, um, okay. you know, it's, it is the need of the hour just as much as coronavirus is. And um, just to give you sort of a very small and quick summary of the work that on climate change. Um, the reason we sort of decided to set up the sustainability portfolio in the first place is because at the moment, climate-focused philanthropic funding in India remains very low. It's less than 10% of total philanthropic funding. And it's mostly concentrated in, in sectors like agriculture, energy, and the environment. And there's a lot of reasons for this because, you know, despite the opportunity, philanthropies face a, fest, a set of challenges that they require assistance with from a lack of technical knowledge in how to connect climate change action to their current activities, as well as, of course, the absence of a collective climate strategy to establish best practices as well as programs. So we chose to sort of take that plunge in climate change as the Tata Trust, and we built and incubated a platform called the India Climate Collaborative. And right now we have over 10 international foundations, such as SIF, Bloomberg, Hewlett, Packard, et cetera, as well as 10 of the country's foremost um, philanthropies who've come together to found the ICC. And we are mandated to amplify and spread local solutions where a coordinated ecosystem of Indian donors, implementers, government representatives, businesses, academia, uh, civil society and communities um, and we're working very close together with the international climate community so we're hoping to sort of use this platform to really drive collective investment and connect diverse voices around this space and in doing so create a very uniquely Indian response to climate change one that is attuned to our needs and development priorities now as you can imagine with coronavirus um, there are certain sort of concerns around um, you know, how this might affect the entire climate change crisis um, with regards to not just uh, what's going to happen in India, but of course, globally. So a couple of points here. From the geopolitical perspective, the coronavirus has forced borders shut, but climate change calls for open borders. Um, you know, the climate crisis is and is going to continue to be one of the major factors spurring the movement of human beings across borders. And if we're to survive as a species, we have to understand that no boat can save us except the one that we build together. Um, the second is finances. So finances that have been earmarked for climate is likely to go towards other activities. For the next two years, politicians will be focused on relaunching the economy and the economic recession, which is widely believed to be on the cards, is not good news for climate either because strong economies are better able to cope with change. So we are gonna see a shift there. We might also lose a year to a year and a half in climate negotiations in terms of policymaking. 2020 is primed to be crucial uh, for climate negotiations this year because countries have to submit their 2050 plans to the UN, uh, stating how they plan to continue to align with the Paris Agreement in both the short and the long term. But the corona crisis is likely to delay these crucial deadlines um, that should be met before the UN Climate Change Conference, which is COP26, which is in Glasgow in November. So that timeline is now thrown open. So what is the good news? The good news, and this is something that Bill Gates pointed out, um, uh, Arnav, I'm sure you know about this as well. This was last week in his conversation with Chris Anderson of TED. He said, you know, and this is really true, and I believe it as well, maybe people will start believing in scientists again. Um, the idea that innovation and science and the world working together, um, that is the one commonality between these two problems. 
And so I don't think it has to necessarily be a huge setback for other Red Sea issues like climate change, for instance. It is remarkable that we're living in a time where you're seeing such a union being formed between scientists, policymakers, and the public. People are asking for strong disease and based on scientific evidence, policymakers are taking action. So that, that's really good news. I think the final sort of point that I really want to make, and this is more a introspective uh, you know, reflection as a result of a lot of home time, um, that there are some other lessons here. And I've been thinking a lot about you know, how crises work. And um, I think my reflections this week have to do with time which is a variable we often seriously underappreciate, especially in the development sector. Physical problems and the climate change, sorry, the climate change crisis and coronavirus are the pertinent examples here, are about time. And what's striking to me is the similarities I said between these two cases. So just to give you a quick example, the first cases of coronavirus emerged in Saudi Arabia and the US on January 20th and 21st. The Koreans responded immediately, rolling out a really widespread testing regimen. It was disruptive, but that nation flattened the curve and is now looking at the pandemic from the rearview mirror. In other countries, we have delayed. The leaders have not necessarily wanted to see numbers growing. It was convinced that somehow these numbers would go away by themselves. And the virus has gained a lot of momentum. Similarly, with climate change, we have we've had effective warning in the late 1980s, the, late 90, the early 1990s. At that time, we could have made very disruptive efforts to change the, the way we, we exist in this world, to cut carbon emissions, but we didn't. And since then, since 1988, we have emitted more industrial carbon than in all of prior human history, utterly failing to flatten the curve. As a result, we now have to act in far more disruptive ways than ever before. And this lesson about time has been a very hard earned one and we cannot forget it because in the case of the virus, we need to keep moving with all distance. And in the case of climate, we need to start moving with all possible haste to transition towards building the right kind of future for ourselves. So we have to figure out how we use this time to ensure that the future we are building and the economies we are going to rebuild are done in a such a way that they are for the benefit of all and to really build a prosperous and better sort of future for everyone. So that's a great analogy, Shloka. And I think the other commonality is that they are both exponential problems. And the best solutions are not the ones that address them after the exponential curve has taken off, but the ones that prevent that rise, right? That flatten the curve proactively. Um, great analogy. Thank you so much for that. I see a lot of comment on that before we move yeah. forward. Sure. Sorry, just to interrupt. I think, you know, uh, we've seen that in any crisis, uh, you know, all stakeholders have two important responsibilities, right? They have to solve the immediate problem. Uh, you know, there is no, uh, you know, you have to solve it. It's right in front of you to solve it. And the second is to prevent, you know, make sure that we keep it not from happening again. Uh, you know, the outbreak, uh, the C-19 outbreak reminds us that, you know, the health pandemics or climate change, which Shlokov talked about, you know, these are like what we call, and Kofi Annan actually used to call it at UN, these are problems without passports. Uh, you know, they transcend borders, uh, you know, and they are the real weapons of mass destruction. Absolutely. Uh, and if you're not tackling this, you know, uh, at the cost of millions of lives and billions of economic productivity, so I think we really need to, you know, put attention to these, uh, you know, from a long-term resilience standpoint, uh, while we look at solving the immediate crisis at hand. Yep. And it is easy to miss this in the euphoria of, or the panic of uh, managing the crisis when it's hitting us. Uh, but also the message is to build muscles that make us resilient to these black swan attacks uh, in good times. Right. So the work of several decades in strengthening grassroots presence in communities of healthcare, building capabilities of families and communities to address healthcare uh, as first responders uh, without overloading the medical, the already fragile medical healthcare system. Uh, the investments in training Anganwadi workers in a country where the doctor to patient ratio is not so great and will not fix itself in any near time future uh, are all very important in these scenarios. And I think yeah, very good messages to take away from uh, your responses. Thank you so much, Loka and Anand. Uh, I see a lot of questions here that are in the line of 
you know how are we uh, prioritizing the economic fallout of the lockdown uh, the ones most impacted by the current crisis are not likely to be the victims of the virus far more numbers are going to be uh, bearing the brunt of the measures we have taken to control the virus any quick responses there Anav, let me put you on the spot. Yeah, no, sure. I mean, I think, you know, the economic uh, fallout from this, I think Shloka also alluded to before, uh, you know, it will play out. I think the economic recession is in front of us, uh, you know, and it's uh, looking like a global uh, recession in this case. Uh, you know, I think uh, one thing I've seen that, you know, all central banks, uh, you know, if someone in invades us from space, the first thing which we'll do is, is to reduce interest rates. Uh, I think, you know, the bankers are trying to solve it as a financial problem and not as a health pandemic problem. So I think, you know, while we look at the financial system from an economic standpoint, you know, I think we also look at, you know, uh, how we can develop corpuses and resilience in the communities, you know, and build those systemic solutions, uh, you know, which can take us out of poverty, uh, you know, for multiple years, at least in India. Uh, and also globally, I think Absolutely. we need to mm -hmm. redefine of the entire systems that we look at. I mean, look at an example of a country like Italy, right? They've reduced their expenditure on health uh, over the last five years. Uh, the U.S., you know, continues to not have, hasn't has an imperfect health system. Um, I think, you know, it's a major, uh, you know, shock uh, to the economy in that case. And I think, you know, uh, things like which governments are responding to by doing direct benefit transfer, uh, either to the people in the short term, I think those kind of measures, you know, will need to continue for some time, I think, to prop up the economy and to bring up consumption, uh, you know, but we also then need to look at long term systemic solutions for each of the problems, you know, all the societal issues that we face. Uh, I think we'll have to redefine how, you know, education uh, happens in the world. Uh, so many children are not able to go to school and, you know, a lost year in education can have, you know, a dramatic effect. Uh, you know, on the entire economy uh, from a human capital standpoint. Right? So I think we need to both look at the short term of this, but also then, you know, look at long term systemic solutions, uh, both economically and also, you know, uh, from a government uh, standpoint and how, they, how we start investing our scarce capital uh, to different sectors. So part of me is wondering if it is also an inflection point in the way we will look at problems. Uh, you might be familiar with the work we do with Omidyar Network in land and housing, and we've looked at the housing problem for a long time with the lens of this being a poverty problem. And what the COVID crisis currently is shining light on is that it's a societal problem, right? Your informal settlements in cities like Mumbai are a powder keg waiting to blow up, affecting not just the people living in the informal settlements, but the entire country and world, its repercussions will be felt in very far remote corners of the world. If collectively as society, we do not solve the problem of affordable housing, uh, affordable health care, which is where it all started, uh, are we poorer off? Do you think philanthropy will take a societal good and public good approach uh, far more rigorously than treating it as their problem versus our grant. Uh, will the nature of philanthropy become more collaborative as a result of what we are seeing unfold in this COVID story? Um, I mean, I can try answering that, but I, I mean, my answer is a most definite yes. Um, I think we've had to sort of acknowledge that a while ago because most of these problems are wicked problems, so to speak, in the sense that they are um, highly complex. And uh, I think we have to sort of take a stand on issues such as that, but it is going to need to sort of, you know, um, imbibe or involve really collective response. Um, and I think, you know, not just collective response in terms of sort of how we... Um, how we choose to come together, um, or rather that operating principle, like you pointed out, Sudha, but it's also more about the, the shared vision 
right? Like what is it, what is that direction or that gaze that we all want to turn towards together? And I think that's something that we kind of have to really build on as a as a sector and as a society is 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 reimagining um, that world and and what we sort of envision for ourselves and for future generations to come. There are a number of um, spaces now perhaps um, where we can sort of start building in those principles already you know um, you are going to see you know a need as I said to boost economic growth after the coronavirus lockdown and that doesn't mean that you necessarily have to sideline green objectives you know um, you might find as a result of a shut the shutdown a, a, a natural swerve in the direction of clean tech and renewables, you know, uh, the prices for oil, for instance, are continuing to plummet, um, you know, because of the ongoing price war um, between Saudi Arabia and Russia, but also because of, you know, cor the cor coronavirus issue. And you might find renewable alternatives like solar power and wind energy becoming less competitive, less interesting to investors. How are we going to build on those um, those pieces that are sort of starting to emerge from this. And that has to be a collective uh, vision, just as much it is as it is a collective sort of effort. Understood. Yeah, you want to take that also, or you want to, you know, take Yeah, I'm keen to hear what your uh, thoughts are on not losing momentum on the long-term bets. Uh, so, Anand, before you go ahead, just one quick thing, just doing a time check. We have six minutes to go in the hour. We have around 25 open questions. So there's no way we'll be able to get to those. We, so now you've already been covering the questions, but just wanted to let everyone know, keep the questions coming. We'll make sure to get back to you with responses to the stuff that we are not able to cover today. Yeah. What I also rather poorly attempted to do was to club them. Uh, yeah. More than one question on a single theme. Uh, but yes, absolutely, we should. Uh, go through. Yes, and I'm sorry, uh, go ahead. No, I think so that we have open questions. So you suggest the next one. I think, uh, you know, uh, Shloka kind of answered that. I think, you know, our focus has always been on collaborative, uh, you know, and collaborative philanthropy is integral, uh, you know, working different philanthropic foundations coming together, but also working closely with governments, uh, you know, and private sector. And there are examples of that, you know, audacious uh, educate girls, which you mentioned, you know, the ICC, which Shloka is leading. You know, is another great collaborative uh, co-impact. Uh, you know, which we are uh, part of, along with Nandan Nilakini from India. Uh, you know, is also again a great collaborative. And all are trying to look at you know systemic uh, problems from a systemic, uh, long-term lens, uh, while also having near-term, mid-term goals. Uh, you know, so I think that collaboration will you know continue to increase. And you know, again with Corona, also you've seen that a lot of collaboration is also stemmed in place, where people are trying to partner with governments. You know, at the Gates Foundation, we've seen uh, uh, Welcome Trust, MasterCard, uh, CZI, uh, you know, are working together on a therapeutic accelerator uh, to get more innovative solutions out. Uh, you know, so I think collaboration will increase and I think innovation uh, will also increase. I think going back to that scientist frame, which, uh, you know, Shloka alluded to, uh, you know, I think that innovation plus collaboration at scale, I think, you know, would be probably in how we would have to start looking at these uh, societal problems. Correct. And another great example is the India Relief Fund that Give India is pulling together with uh, various different philanthropists in the country. Uh, and the Gates Foundation is part of it. Uh, reduce the scatter in terms of discovering causes and nonprofits working on those causes. Make sure that no area of relief activity goes underserved uh, and no area goes over-invested in at the cost of other areas. So covering the immediate response with uh, ensuring everyone has PPEs, that there are sufficient ventilators, the hardware elements required to manage the healthcare crisis. But there's also equal focus on training and skilling of people on the ground, uh, building capacity, the software elements of this work. A lot of philanthropists are coming together to make a 500 crore uh, uh, fund happen. And I think all of you are also very welcome to participate in it through the Give India platform. Um, if anything, this crisis has taught us, it is that we are in this together. And I like the way Shloka said it. The only boat that will save us is the one that we build together. Um, uh, and the reactions, uh, I presume, Amit, we should be wrapping up now. Uh, 
committing to respond to these questions <coughs> offline. Yeah. I think so. Yeah, I think uh, we are uh, running out of time now, but uh, we've got a lot of uh, great points covered. I think, uh, like you did, right? You combined a lot of questions that were coming in and were able to address them, but still, specifically point by point, I think it will still behoove us to uh, respond back, and that's something we will do. Uh, but good. do you want to maybe do some final closing? Uh, points or how do you want to do this? Yes, so I'm very keen to just leave us on a slightly more optimistic note than where we landed uh, with the Q&A. I'm sure there's a lot of anxiety around here, uh, just the times that we live in. Uh, but the immediate need is to focus on the critical necessities. Right? There's of course epidemic control in healthcare, the livelihoods and skill development and particularly micro entrepreneurship development the kind that reduces the pressure on communities to migrate, right? And vitalizes economic activity in parts of the country where very little is happening by that way uh, is very critical. There are a lot of grassroots programs adopting uh, the graduation approach, for instance, that BRAC has very successfully deployed in Bangladesh that slows down the pace of urbanization and builds capacity in communities to solve their own problems in their own geographies. I think that's a huge refocus area in working with the repatriated migrants. Uh, the next need would be to revive the critical sectors. Uh, there's a huge food security issue coming from the fact that we do not have the social security infrastructure, even something as simple as food stamps in this country although we do have a very good public distribution system, uh, it is to ensure that this does not spiral into malnutrition and undo the good work of several decades in moving the needle on that problem. One in three children in India is at the risk of being stunted or wasted under the age of five. That number cannot go worse. Um, and similarly, education, like uh, Arna Vilsantosh mentioned, this is not... Uh, a luxury that a lot of schools in the public system have to continue education through remote man means such as uh, you know ed tech tools or uh, telecommuting to school we have to solve that problem in the revival phase and also of sanitation everything else that will pile up in the absence of attention during the refocus phase and longer term i think there are no alternatives to building a strong civil society uh, with a focus on behavior change and the strong public systems in healthcare and in other areas. Today it is a healthcare crisis, but you never know where the next uh, major global event will come from. Uh, it could be a climate crisis very equally. Uh, all the time keeping our eye on the inequality indicators. India's Gini index slope shows us to be one of the most unequal countries worldwide. Every large event further aggravates the inequality situation in this country. If philanthropy, talent, and government do not come together uh, to solve the problem of inequality, the compounding effects are just too drastic. Um, uh, and the more proactive we are in addressing it, it builds our resilience as a society, as a country, to deal with these events and continue that pathway out of poverty. Um, thank you so much, Arnav Shloka, for your very valuable inputs and Santosh for making this happen. Um, thank you to everyone that attended, that commented, and that sent Q&As, and you know, we do commit to responding to each one of them. Uh, stay safe wherever you are, uh, and stay optimistic. I think finally what gets, uh, what gives one energy to combat these huge issues uh, is a really deep belief that together we can make the world better. Uh, the social sector is an amazing place that way uh, to live this purpose out. And thank you so much for uh, engaging the way you have. Amit, over to you to wrap this up. I guess, thank you so much. That was very, very nicely put, Sudha. Um, so I'll, I'll just quickly ask Santosh if uh, there's any, uh, you know, any 
Anything you want to share with the audience about, you know, connecting it back to the school uh, work world? A uh, couple of things. Uh, it's actually three things. One is uh, thank you, Nudge team. I know this is a lot of back end work and tech works seamlessly at this time, which is a challenge. Um, Arnav and Shloka, an incredible call to action. And I do think that if one thing that we love at school, it's about collective action and coming together. And more than ever, I think this is a moment for us to bring this community together. And thanks for your words. And between the four of us, I think we have enough power and resources to keep this community alive and make a commitment towards that collaborative spirit of how do we get through this tough time. And lastly, just a plug to say tomorrow is a school awards announcement. Um, we are using this time of challenge to be optimistic about the future and celebrate and acknowledge the work of six amazing organizations. It's 11 a.m. Eastern time U.S. is going to be uh, the announcement on April 2nd. So just asking everybody to tune in. Other than that, um, once again, thanks, Nudge team, and looking forward to keep the conversation going. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Bye. <clears throat> Woohoo! Just us.